welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're privileged enough this morning to be hearing from Francesca Veronis, um, who will be speaking to us about the Atlantis and Marilka initiatives, which look at uh, in integrating the impacts of marine plastic pollution uh, into life cycle assessments, which we're very excited to hear. Thanks a lot for having me to present in this webinar. Um, as Tara said, my name is Francesca Veronis. I'm a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And I'm going to talk about two things today, the Marilka Initiative and the Atlantis project. Both are dedicated to work on including the impacts of marine plastic in life cycle assessment. And now, um, you know, not everyone is familiar with life cycle assessment. So what is this actually? So life cycle assessment is a method to quantify the total sustainability impact of a product or a service a process over the entire life cycle of a product or process. And that starts basically with raw material extraction. Think, for example, of a like, you know, a product like your phone or your computer that you're sitting in front of now. It needs different kinds of raw materials. These are transported to the production site. It's produced somewhere in the world. It's distributed on the market again somewhere else in the world. It's used which means, for example, if you're looking at a computer that would consume mostly like energy but or like electricity. But I mean, if you have other things like, for example, you could make an alte of a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, then you will also have the, the water and the coffee beans, etc. And then you have the end of life. So hopefully some of it can be recycled, which would go into the cycle again, and some of it will be deposited uh, somewhere. So LCA is a mature environmental management methodology, and actually it's really widely used in Europe. It's also used, for example, for the PEF, so the Product Environmental Footprints of the European Commission. So it's really very widely used. So you collect basically all the resource uses and all the emissions that are created. And then what we do is basically you assign um, an impact to these um, resource uses and emissions, like you know, saying a little bit in a, in a simplified man manner. And just as an example, it's not only used by governments like the European uh, Union, it's also used um, increasingly by companies, for example, Unilever. They use LCAs routinely for assessments in their, in their value chains. They did, for example, a case study on the use of recycled plastic for their bottles of shampoo and, and soap, etc. And that's, of course, very good that they do that. But, of course, um, well, they cannot assess the whole impact because currently we do not really have operational models for quantifying the impact of plastic pollution. So that brings me to this slide. What is actually missing in life cycle assessment today? Very, you know, bluntly speaking, we're missing 71% of the global surface. Common life cycle assessment tools today are largely disregarding impacts that are happening in the oceans. So that means we are actually neglecting impacts that take place on 71% of the global surface in the biggest ecosystem on Earth. Oceans are also considered to be the next economic frontier. And that means that we need to really make sure we actually have these decision support tools ready for the sustainable exploitation of this vast ecosystem if we want to safe keep it for future generations. Everyone is talking about like blue growth, that it's critical for our future. That's also pointed out by the, the UN. Um, but you know, we don't really have the tools to assess what is sustainable and what not. The UN also has dedicated one entire sustainable development goal to the life below water, which is ocean. So it's really, really important. And just to show the framework that we use in life cycle assessment at the moment, and I'm not going to go into detail here, it's uh, quite a lot of information here. Um, you know, you have the, all the elementary flows that you have here, and then you have a, a lot, a huge list, basically, of impact categories that we have here. And if you just quickly glance through them, I mean, they're overarching, but we have many different categories, but very few which have a component that is relevant for the marine system. We have something in climate change, we have something in ecotoxicity, we have something in eutrophication. And Seabed use actually is not yet quite operational, but that's basically it. Um, so that's the only thing that we really have. So again, the oceans are really missing. And this is exactly where basically 
both Atlantis and Marilka come into play and where the motivation of uh, these projects is actually really coming from. So I'm going to talk first about the Marilka initiative. Marilka stands for Marine Impacts in Lifecycle Assessment. And this is an initiative or like a network that was founded by Anne-Marie Boulet, Jan Maskesrove, John Woods and myself. So it's uh, like, you know, quite a diverse set of researchers that have set this up because we come from really, you know, different parts of the world, from Zizireg in Canada and the, the um, Catholic University in Lima in Peru and the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Norway. So it's really sort of like an international initiative. Um, we also get now the support of the Life Cycle Initiative, which is hosted by UN Environment and also by FSLCI, which is the Forum for Sustainability through Life Cycle Innovation. And the reason why we established this, or like sort of the aim of uh, Marilka, is really to develop models that allow to integrate the impact of marine litter into life cycle assessment, sort of really as a main focus, we focus now on plastic as part of the marine litter. So that is really sort of the, the main focus. And it's really an emerging field. There's many, many people that are actually starting to work in the life cycle assessment community that are starting, starting to work on marine impacts from plastic pollution. So it's really one of the main goals of Marilka to build collaborations between these researchers, researchers that are doing this work related to this topic so that we can really develop robust and well thought through methods instead of actually competing with each other and sort of, you know, reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, so we really want to try and make sure that we can sort of, you know, talk to each other and develop the methods in a way that are really harmonized with each other so that we can use them next to each other and not, you know, that they're not compatible. So, for example, if we have an impact category looking at ingestion of microplastics and then one looking at the entanglement of macroplastics, it would be nice if they would use the same sort of like underlying principles or in the models and end up with the same metrics so that we actually can use both of them that we are when we are like assessing something. And we try to foster this in Marilka by monthly scientific committee presentations where we really sit together everyone every month someone else is presenting. Then we know what people are working on, it also allows us to give feedback and discuss with people to figure out okay here, maybe someone else could actually be of help or okay you're doing a similar thing that i'm doing and it's really also helpful as a sort of like a peer review, even before you actually send things out for review, review. So I think it's really helpful. And then Marilka is also part of the GLAM project. And the GLAM project is a project of the Life Cycle Initiative hosted by UN Environment, which is about giving guidance for the sort of choosing the best set, uh, let's say, less possible, best possible life cycle impact assessment models available. And Marilka is tasked with coming up with the best models to quantify the impacts from marine plastic in this GLAM uh, project. And that uh, is to be completed in 2023. So we have basically, well, two more years, more or less, a little bit more than two years to, to uh, complete our, our models there. As a first output in this Marilka group, we have uh, written a framework publication that is currently under review where we really want to sort of set the scene for the further development of life cycle impact assessment models. So, I mean, in life cycle impact assessment, um, we do have different, you know, parts in, in, in models. So we have always something that we call the fate, which is about like how a pollution on, on the, in this case, the, the plastic waste is actually distributing in the environment. Where does how much of the plastic come from? Where does it enter the ocean? Where is it also released sort of like in the ocean? What happens with the fragmentation of particles? Where is it moved with the ocean circulation, etc.? So that we sort of like, you know, know this and, you know, it can be transported, can be originated in the air or terrestrial systems, fresh water or directly in the marine. You can have like deposition or, or floating plastic, etc. And then we have something which is called the exposure which um, is then really more like, okay, who is actually exposed to this plastic? 
Um, and that can be different things, you know, it could be humans, it can be ecosystems and species, it can also be structures that are sort of like exposed to this plastic pollution. And then we're looking at sort of like the effect. So what's then um, the damage that is caused actually by these plastic uh, particles. And that can again be very different. It can be, you know, that certain plastic particles have toxic effects through the additives. It can be physical effects like the entanglement or ingestion um, of plastic, etc. And in the end, um, you know, we have what we call different damaged values here. We have like human health, ecosystem quality, and then socioeconomic assets. And that's what I also meant with trying to be harmonized, because if we have, say, uh, impact of entanglement and microplastic ingestion for related to ecosystem quality, both basically should have the same metric in the end. And you see, uh, there's a lot of work to be actually um, done here. And we have another more like simplified version of this framework figure and showed basically with different colors here um, are who is actually already working on which part of um, this framework. And you see that there's many different people working on it. It's actually not yet complete. I think there are more people who are working on it. What you also see is that at the moment, Marilka is really focusing on ecosystems. We don't really have anyone working on humans um, at the moment. Yeah, and if we go now further to Atlantis, then this is basically what Atlantis tries to cover. So it's quite uh, broad. So the Atlantis, the whole title of the project is Whales, Waste and Sea Walnuts, Incorporating Human Impacts on the Marine Ecosystem Within Lifecycle Assessment. If you piece all the red letters together, you end up with Atlantis, which is slightly more easy to remember than the whole title of it. So this is a, an ERC starting grant project. So it's funded by the European Research Commission. It's a five-year project to investigate these impacts within the framework of LCA. Uh, we are rather at the beginning still. So we have uh, had this project for, for roughly one year now. So we have some first results, but mostly it's just work in progress. And I'm more like also showing like the plans and the goals of this um, project. So, I think that's you know known to everyone um, here in this uh, webinar. But like you know, the impacts from plastics are very diverse, about as diverse as the sources of plastic. Um, you know, if you have large plastic pieces, like for example, fishing gear or plastic bags, can be entanglement or ingestion or smothering of the bottom dwelling ecosystems, depriving them of oxygen. And we have species, you know, species like the sea turtles or the the seals and birds and I think you know lots of different taxa are actually uh, impacted by these plastic pollution and then of course we also have microplastics um, for us in LCA we define microplastics as particles with a diameter smaller than five millimeters and there's different definitions out there but that's the one that we use um, so these microplastics can either stem from the breaking down of macroplastics through abrasion, UV radiation, etc. Or it can be of primary origin, like you know, powders for 3D printing, raisin beads, etc. Um, these can be ingested as well. It's suspected that these may actually accumulate through the food chain, which means potentially humans might also be affected. So we do need, the first step is really, we need to differentiate between different plastic types because we have different effects between these. Now, for the fate, there are some models, um, rather maybe let's call it preliminary a bit models. This is uh, from John Beck et al. I think that's probably a study that is known to almost everyone. Um, how much plastic is actually entering the oceans? That was now in a study for 2010. And you know we can use models like that and, and updated models like that as an input for like land-based um, plastic. And then we also have um, uh, transport models based on ocean circulation models that tell us like how are they potentially distributing in the oceans. What we need to then also work on is to distinguish between different types of plastic, whether they're floating or, or not. Uh, also distribution in particle size in different locations, 
And that's a bit the challenging part, um, but there are some studies on that as well, so that we hope to be able to, to integrate. And with this, we can create what we called before sort of this fate factor, which is giving us information about the kilogram of plastic in a specific location of the ocean due to the well, mismanagement in the end of a kilogram of plastic on land or also in the fisheries uh, sector. And we need to do that, that in a sort of a spatially differentiated way. So we need to take the geography into account because, I mean, it's not distributed equally and also species are not distributed equally around the world. So we, we have, uh, it's very important that we actually take the spatial component um, into, into account. Now for the effect factor, um, that is based on information about the potential exposure areas of species and the amount of plastic that is modeled to, to be present in these areas. So here you have from uh, Marte, my PhD student, you have uh, two sort of preliminary maps on that. Um, on the left is an example for the stellar sea lion and on the right is an example for the Australian fur seal. So you have the um, exposure areas in the dotted uh, lines and then you also have in, in colored like the plastic debris concentration where we currently have um, well, information for. So that's sort of like one thing that, that we use as, um, as an input for the effect factor. And in addition, uh, Marty collected data on the number of species that were recorded entangled of a specific population. So what, what the overall population number is, so which fraction of the population is actually getting entangled and that with this information, and the location that we already are, we can create um, like a curve like this, which is called a species sensitivity distribution that shows for these species, which fraction of species is threatened at the given concentration of plastic. And then based on that, um, we can look at, we can create maps that look like this. So this is a map that shows the fraction of species that are affected in different parts of the world. As you see, it's maybe not extremely surprising. It's reflecting the location of some of the garbage patches. But if you if you look closer, you are especially around Asia, you see also that they have um, very high fractions of potentially affected species in these areas um, there. And of course, that's also because you have high concentrations of, of, of plastic there. Now, if we have this information, and then together we couple this with the transport model for, for plastic waste, that then allows us to estimate the potential damage that a plastic product can have on the marine environment um, because we are actually mismanaging a certain amount or type of plastic in our country or on land. So for now, that is focusing on floating plastic and on entanglement. But I mean, we plan to also uh, look at other impact categories. Um, now in the title of the Atlantis project, just to also uh, touch on that, we had also sea walnuts. So what about sea walnuts? Um, I don't know if anyone knows what a sea walnut is, what it metaphorically could stand for. This is a sea walnut. It's basically, we use it metaphorically for all other marine invasive species. It's a stingless jellyfish, jellyfish-like animal. It's native to the east coast of uh, North America. Um, and basically has been shipped with ballast water to uh, European waters. It was discovered first in the Black Sea that it's there. Um, it is really one of the main environmental issues in the Black Sea. It's one of the world's most major, most dangerous like marine major species. It then also spread through the, to the Caspian Sea, again through ballast water of ships. And in both places, it really formed immense populations. And because this sea walnut is feeding on zooplankton, but commercial fish like anchovies also feed on that, then that has resulted in a collapse of the anchovy population, and then consequentially also led to a collapse of the local fisheries. So it's not just the ecosystem that is affected, it's also sort of like the ecosystem services and the livelihoods of people that are then affected. And since then, it has spread through the Mediterranean basin, the Northwestern Atlantic, um, the Baltic Sea as well. So the second part of the Atlantis project is uh, marine invasive species. And also there, the threats that are caused by invasive species are extremely 
um, varied. It can be that they are introducing like habitat changes because maybe they're covering vast expanses of habitat, replacing formerly dominant native plants. Um, then, you know, it can just be predating and competition like the sea walnut, for example, is, is predating on, on zooplankton and so decreasing a common food source for other uh, species. Then it can also be that they are just displacing native species, so you know, invasive species outcompeting the native ones, etc. Um, so also there we have to to be quite specific um, geographically, and th there is actually also a link to the plastic because I mean the two most common causes for marine invasive species to be transported somewhere else are uh, ballast water and the hull of the ships. But the third most important vector to transport marine invasive species is rafting on plastic particles or litter, not just plastic, but mostly plastic. So it's actually, you know, quite relevant um, to also look at that connection between invasive species and plastics. And that's what we basically aim to do. So where we are now there, just to finish this off, is what we're trying to do is we're building a database for marine invasive species based on other databases that list these invasive species but do not really give the geographic information. Um, so what we want to know is where are these species native, where do they actually end up, and then we also want to know which species are there and which species are actually affected by these species. Um, that's just one screenshot of, of a preliminary result of this of this uh, database that we're building. Um, and that is really the basis then for us to develop a model for um, invasive species in life cycle assessment. So that was it from my side. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, it's it's great to hear. Um, everyone, please feel free to send through your questions or your comments in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, thank you so much, Francesca. I think it's great to hear about uh, the life cycle assessment analysis that's currently happening, given that it's such a thorough um, method of, of assessing impacts. Um, I wonder, you spoke a bit about microplastics um, and the various sources in terms of primary or secondary microplastics. Are, how do those fit into the life cycle assessments that you're currently working with? Well, it's just, um, you know, it, it depends on the product in the end that you, you're looking at. For example, if you want to make a, um, like a life cycle assessment about like 3D printing, for example, then, you know, you just, the, the microplastics would be a direct input into that process, basically. And then, you know, what you would, what we would, well, need to model. Well, first of all, is the effect, of course, like, you know, what is a potential effect of this microplastics, ingestion, for example, being one, and accumulation, and then know, okay, how do they get into the ocean? So which fraction of, like, say, 3D printing powders are maybe, you know, going missing, so to speak, uh, during transport and are reaching, actually, the, the oceans? Because, I mean, there's, you know, of course, like, intentional sort of like releases, if you want, of plastic, if you have just have littering or like, you know, mismanagement of, of waste, but you could also have what is maybe more like unintentional, if things are sort of like lost during a transport, uh, and that, you know, happens again and again, um, that ships, for example, lose some of the containers, etc., that are then um, leading to plastics being in the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, there's a comment that's come through that says, thanks so much. How much confidence do you have in the data used to develop the comparative maps you showed in this excellent presentation? Um, <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a good question for my PhD student. No, I think, I mean, <laughs> she, she's doing really an excellent job for, for collecting this, uh, this, this data. Um, I mean, it's very different depending on the species, I would say. I mean, for some species, we have good information and a lot of information. And for other species, it's, it's much less. So I think the data as such, um, I'm not, uh, you know, the data as such, I have pretty good confidence um, in, in the data, actually. What is more the thing is that we have data on individual populations 
but we're sort of trying to extrapolate this to the whole world, if you want. So, I mean, we're extrapolating, if we have some data for like turtles for different populations, we assume then this is sort of like valid for the turtle around the world, the same species. So that's introducing a much larger uncertainty. And there's always a trade-off as well here, you know, um, how much uncertainty are we willing to accept versus basically just leaving things blank. And there is a bit of debate on going in, in, in the LCA community here as well. Um, because the thing is, if we don't have an impact category at all, people very often assume it's basically zero. And that really happens with plastic because you, many LCAs that are containing plastic or plastic uh, packaging, et cetera, is basically trying, you know, it's basically coming out very positive because all the impact of the waste is actually not taken into account. So we are thinking of like, yeah, you know, maybe something more rough, but then at least having something is, is, uh, is actually quite valuable. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, there's another question that's come through from Rafila that says, thank you so much for the interesting talk. Uh, did you see a distinction between the northern and southern hemisphere in debris concentrations? There are different uh, debris concentrations, definitely. Um, I would not necessarily say it's just about like northern and southern hemisphere. It's really about like also, you know, uh, well, first of all, it's of course, where is how much plastic entering the ocean, but then it's also how it's actually transported through the ocean. So you do have these garbage patches that are, um, you know, accumulating actually the plastic. And I mean, yes, there are some sort of like more, you know, hot spots um, of, of plastic. Um, but I don't think we can and should just differentiate it in a northern and southern hemisphere. It's more like a geographic distinction around sea basins in that sense. So, I mean, you know, the ocean currents in the end don't really care about whether it's a northern or southern hemisphere. Uh, thanks, Rafiwe. Um, uh, and thanks, uh, Francesca, for, for your answer. Um, you, uh, as you mentioned earlier um, about the, the accuracy of the data and that and how it would depend on which species you're looking at. And obviously there are so many variables uh, to consider with all of this. Um, but in terms of uh, the various intervention methods for plastic pollution, have, uh, life have the life cycle assessments you've been working with looked into any of those at all? For example, bioplastics and how that would impact um, marine species. No, we have not. Uh, we have not done that. Um, mostly because the, I think you know the, the models are not finished yet, and we don't know. You know, we have not modeled bioplastics separately really so far. I mean, you know, in the fate, this is something that we may want to to consider, um, but we have not done that yet. Uh, thanks, Francesca. Uh, I, I just wondered because I know they're often sort of marketed as as a solution, yeah. but they might not necessarily degrade in the water and then have the same the same kind of exactly. impacts. Yes, yeah. so that that's probably the most crude. That, that that's probably you know the information that we would then need to actually be able to include it is is, is precisely what you say. You know, how do they then degrade and uh, how you know how does this affect actually the distribution in the oceans? Because I mean. Do they degrade just into smaller particles and then you basically don't see them anymore and they're still there? Or what does it what does happen with it? You know, what's the time frame as well, you know, of this degradation? Uh, agreed. No, I'm, I'm sure there's there's so many various factors that you have to consider. Uh, in the framework slide that you showed um, with all the various um, the inventories and the fates and things like that, uh, can you comment on 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 the concentration of, of research that's happening in the different areas and um, perhaps why there isn't as much research being done on the other sectors? Is it a lack of data or or just very complicated? <laughs> I wonder if you can comment on that. Um, you mean that one? Let me see. You mean, so, you mean this one or like that one? Yes, yes, that one. Yeah. Uh, um, sorry, sorry, the other one. Um, the other one? <laughs> I think it was one that, one? that one, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, first of all, I think it has a bit to do with um, the background of people that have founded it. 
we all basically work in, um, in more, more ecosystem related um, impacts um, and, and less so on, on, on humans. Um, and then, of course, you know, when we started to sort of promote this and, and, and ask people if they wanted to join, etc. So we, then we did target more um, people that were working on ecosystems because that's the people that we sort of like knew. Um, so I don't know to say it uh, <laughs> clearly if we have basically all the people that are working on plastic stuff in LCA actually included here. I doubt it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that I, I do think that there is um, more data available right now on ecosystems than is on, on humans. It's more certain in a sense um, what the effects are than, than is for humans. I mean, I've seen many studies coming out now also with um, impacts at least of like, or not impact necessary, but more like, you know, exposure of humans to um, plastics, but, my, yeah, I mean, in the end, they're also very, you know, most of them are, are based on, on lab studies then as well. So still ecosystem or like still species. So I think it's, it, there is slightly, I would say there is uh, slightly less data. And then I think um, it's maybe, you know, the, the, the exposure and effect type of thing to be a bit like, you know, opportunistic in that sense, it's easier than the fate. So there are people working on the fate, but also less because it's much more complicated. So I um, think that's also one reason. Thank you, Francesca. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And, and obviously, as you say, um, <laughs> the proximity of all the marine creatures and species to high, higher levels of plastic would definitely um, sort of help with the, with the um, finding data in that sector. Um, there is a question that's come through that says, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, life cycle assessments are mostly used for material choices and production processes at the front side. How do you intend to relate the often small particles back to the products they were initially made? And how can you find the relations? Well, there's also different projects on that. So, I mean, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, that's not, that's sort of a little bit outside of the aim of Atlantis to actually find the amount of, of plastics in inventory, so to speak. But there is a, a project from um, a, a consultancy company, Quantis, they're called, it's a plastic leak project, where they were looking exactly at this, like, you know, not for everything, of course, but for some sectors, I think they were looking at like, um, the automobile sectors are like tires and then the textiles. So how much plastic is actually sort of like, you know, released from these products over their life cycle. And that's sort of the first thing. And we can sort of like relate it back to the product. And then of course we need to have the, all the transport processes that they'll tell us, okay, but what fraction of what has been originally ended up, say, in the wastewater is then ending up in the ocean in my location. And that, I think, is just mostly, um, well, statistics in the end and based on these ocean circulation models. So we are really relying a lot on models and data that is actually outside of LCA. So, I mean, there's many models, different models that are, you know, projecting or predicting where plastic particles are, for example, transported, like also from the rivers to the oceans and then within the oceans. And what we basically do is that we take these models and adapt them for life cycle assessment. So we really try not to reinvent the wheel also because we're not oceanographers that could you know, go into all these details there. But that's a project that is, um, yeah, inventory project is going on with the uh, life cycle image, uh, with the Quantis, the, the plastic leaf project. Uh, thank you, Francesca. Um, that that's great to know, and it makes complete sense not to to reinvent the wheel when you're focusing on on the various impacts, the various stages in the life cycle assessment. Um, uh, I, I know you mentioned that uh, you aren't looking at sort of uh, that you aren't necessarily oceanographers and things like that. Um, but are you looking at the kind of the structure of the sea floor at all in terms of um, where things might end up, or or is it mostly uh, um, focusing on ocean currents? Um, for now, what we have is based on ocean currents, so not really on the structures of uh, of the seafloor. Um, but we we have some collaborators um, in the project 
that we have to to again talk to them and see you know they are developing uh, these kind of like the ocean transport models and we will see you know how far and further have they come than, than, than we know at the moment. Thank you Francesca. Um, I don't see any more uh, comments in the questions or the chat um, but it's been really really interesting to hear. I had never heard of sea walnuts before <laughs> um, but um, thank you so much and uh, if anyone has any questions at a later stage uh, you are welcome to to email us or or to contact uh, Francesca if you're happy with that. Sure. Um, uh, do you have any uh, any sort of parting comments to share with us um, in terms of uh, highlights maybe from the, the two projects so far? Um, no, I think, I mean, there's so many different parts that are going on, like like you see in, in, in this slide here. So I think there's many different highlights. So, I mean, there's, you know, many different, you know, publications and projects are really ongoing now. So, I mean, there's very little that is actually really published, but it, I really, you know, looking forward to, to this year where I think like many of these things will actually then be published. So I think then we're going to be a huge step closer to actually having these operational models for plastic impacts in LCA. Uh, thank you, Francesca. It's it's certainly exciting to know that all, all this research is being done and the network that you've established and, and how they're operating in different sectors. So I'm sure I'm sure there'll be some very interesting results coming out of that um, all through your network. Um, I don't see any more questions at this time. Um, so I think if everyone's happy, we can close off here for today. Um, but thank you so much, for, Francesca, for, for sharing this with us today. It's, it's very interesting and very exciting to know what's, what's happening in terms of um, the life cycle, the framework that you are following and all the analysis that's, that's happening. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to present with us today. And we look forward to the results that um, that are going to be published. We'll keep an eye out for those. Um, and thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and we will have a, a last um, session in the series next week, Wednesday, um, when we will be hearing from uh, from Selma from Revolution, Revolution Foundation. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all there. And um, we will be sure to email you once this recorded session has been uploaded. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. If you do have any questions at a later stage, please feel free to email us at webinars at sstafrica.org.za. Thanks everyone. <laughs>